Welcome to the second episode of the Caesura Guided Tour. The Caesura Guided Tour is a series of videos where I build Caesura, an iTunes-inspired music player for Apple platforms, feature by feature. This episode will assume that you're familiar with the concepts introduced in the last episode, so if you haven't seen it, you may want to go back and watch it before this one. In this episode, I'll be implementing basic library management. I'm going to guide you through the implementation of the following features. Adding tracks to the library, including the ripping of MP3 metadata, listing tracks in the library UI, including sorting and keyword search, and deleting tracks from the library. One thing I neglected to mention in the previous episode is that while this series does assume you have some basic programming knowledge, specifically with object-oriented languages, things specific to Swift or how Apple's frameworks function will be explained as we go along. I'm intending for this series to be broadly appealing to basically anyone with a passing interest in software development, whether they're knowledgeable about Apple platforms or not. I just wanted to clear that up for the Apple platform developers who do stumble across this and find themselves wondering why I'm explaining things that seem fairly obvious. Please note that while this episode was recorded after the release of Caesar at 2021.10.20, all code shown will reflect the state of the code base immediately following the implementation of these features. We'll start with adding music to the library. Let's break down what this functionality entails. First, we need a menu item that allows us to bring up a file picker. From the user selected file, we want to extract the metadata fields and obtain the file's location URL. We then need to add the metadata and the file location to the database's track table. Let's start by taking a look at the metadata extractor file. At least for this initial version, the fields we're interested in accessing on these music files are the title, the artist, the album, the genre, the grouping, the year of release, the track number, and the disk number. Luckily, we can access all of these properties via AV Foundation's AV Player. By loading the music file into an AV Player instance, we can iterate through metadata and pull out the values we want into our own metadata fields data structure that we can return. The great thing about this is that the player does not need to be playing for this to work, so we can do this in the background without interrupting playback. The static function extract on the metadata extractor class does exactly that and returns a metadata fields data structure that we can rely on to easily access these metadata fields in a more convenient manner. It takes in a file URL as its parameter, which is conveniently what we're going to get back from the file picker that we'll hook it up to in a little bit, and it also happens to be accepted in AV Player's initializer directly. Now that we can acquire the metadata we want to insert into our database, let's implement the track insertion command in the library service class. The add to library command method needs two arguments to work properly a file URL which lets us load the file when the user requests playback, and the metadata field's data structure that we've extracted from the file. Once we've gotten those, the body of the command method is fairly straightforward. First, we compute the current date so we can save it into the date added field. Then, via an SQL command, we can insert the track into the track database table, passing in all of those metadata fields. You've probably noticed two things in this code. The first is the way we pass these parameters using question marks in the SQL statements, and their values separately as an array. This is to circumvent SQL injection attacks, where specifically formed parameter values could escape their surrounding quotes and modify the actual SQL statements being executed, leading to potential crashes or data loss. The second is how we cast all of these parameters to the any type. When you're using array literals in Swift, the type of your array literal needs to match the type of the method argument, which in this case is an array of any. Putting items of different types in the same array literal does not automatically result in an array of any type. So in order for this to work, we manually need to cast each argument to any. You'll also notice that all of this happens in a do catch block, because as indicated by the try keyword next to database.execute update, the update can crash and throw an exception at any time. Ideally, we would handle the error in some way in that catch block, but I don't know enough about how error flow should be handled within a Mac app yet, so I'm postponing this decision until later. Now that the foundation of this feature is in place, we can go and hook it up to the user interface. Let's start off in the storyboard file in Interface Builder. You can find the Applications menu bar in the application scene, and here, under the Library menu, there is this Add Track to Library menu item. Its keyboard shortcut has been configured to Command O in the Properties pane. An action can be bound to a menu item in Interface Builder by right-click dragging or dragging while holding control to a code object in the scene with IB actions declared. In this case, our only object in the scene that is under our direct control is the app delegate. So I've declared an IB action on the app delegate called import track to library, as you can see here. 
This method, import track to library, is declared as an IB action with the at IB action keyword. At the very start, we have a guard let statement, which I suppose I should explain since this is the first one we've encountered. This combines two concepts in Swift, the guard statement and how let works with optional variables. Guard statements are like the opposite of if statements. It's a syntax pattern that lets you check if certain preconditions are met, and if they aren't, bail out from that function immediately. In this case, our condition is a let statement. Let is like var, but constant. Once a reference has been declared with let, you can't set it to anything else later, and this has additional implications for specific data types. Our let statement is declaring a reference with the name service, and it's assigning it to self.library service, which corresponds to the library service we initialize when the app has finished launching. Self.library service is an instance variable of type library service optional, which is an optional variable. As in other languages, Swift lets you declare variables as optionals. For example, a variable of type optional int can contain an integer or it can contain nil, which is Swift's equivalent to a null value from other languages. If the variable was declared as just an int, it would have to contain an integer and could never be nil. When combined with a guard statement like this, what actually ends up happening is the following. If the value of self.library service is nil because for some reason it's not initialized, the else block will run and return. If self.library service is initialized, your method will continue to run and service will be a constant non-optional reference to self.library service. Basically, this statement just verifies that the prerequisite library service has been initialized, and if it doesn't, selecting the menu option won't do anything. Now in theory though, this shouldn't even be possible, but it's good to just check in case. Once that precondition check is done, we can move on to the meat of this method. The first thing we want to do is bring up a system file picker dialog. So here we declare an NS open panel and we can customize its properties. In this case, we don't want to handle opening directories. We want to handle opening files. We don't want to handle opening multiple files at once yet. We might do this in a future episode. And we want our allowed file types to be audiovisual files recognized by the AV Foundation framework. After customizing these properties, we can run openpanel.runmodal to bring it up for the user. This is what's known as a blocking call, meaning that the rest of the code in our method won't continue to execute until a user action is taken in this dialog. That's why we can immediately follow that with an if statement that checks if our user has selected a file. And we can check that with the OK result type. If they did, we have another guard let statement here that checks that we have a good file URL received from that dialog. If we do, we can move on and extract the metadata through the method that we looked at earlier. So now we've got both of the prerequisites for calling our add to library command, so we're going to do just that. And then assuming that the add to library command succeeds, we want to notify the application to reload the library to reflect the new changes. So we're going to send a reload library notification via the notification center. We'll handle this notification in the next section. And that's it, we've got our first feature down. Fortunately, it's kind of a pain to test this if our app can't also list tracks in the library directly. So let's go implement that right now. The query for getting the tracks in the user's library is implemented as the library collection query method in the library service. It takes two arguments, a keyword filter string and a sort mode identifier. It returns a list of tracks. The base of our query is the select star from track. This SQL expression returns all rows from the track table in no particular order. On its own, this does technically return the contents of the entire library. However, we do want to tack on extra parts to this query based on the parameters that were passed. From the sort mode, which corresponds to the identifier of the table column set in Interface Builder, we will derive an order by clause, which will ask the database to sort by one or more given database columns in ascending or descending order. For now, we're only going to worry about supporting ascending order. If the sort mode is nil, meaning that one has not been specified, or the sort mode is collection order, corresponding to the column that returns the order of tracks in a playlist, in this case, we want to sort the results by the ID column in the database, which should correspond to the order in which they were added to the database. If the sort mode is collection title, we want to sort by the title column. If the sort mode is collection artist, we want to sort by the artist column. If the sort mode is collection album, we want to sort by the album column. This has already been modified in a future version actually. Now we sort by album, disc num, and track num so that individual tracks in an album also appear in their order on that album instead of arbitrarily. 
From the keyword filter string, we will derive a WHERE clause that will check if one or more database columns contain the phrase typed into the keyword filter. This is pretty simple. If we wanted to check that the title column contained the word dog, for example, we would express that as WHERE title like percent sign dog percent sign. So here we can do that dynamically by wrapping the keyword filter string with percent signs and then building our WHERE clause to check each of the columns we're interested in for that expression. In our case, this is the track name, artist, and album columns. Now that we have all three components of our SQL query, here we combine them into our actual SQL query that we'll send to the database. When we get our results, we want to take our database rows that we've gotten from FMDB and convert them into track objects. This loop iterates on each row and converts each one of them into a track object and appends it to the list of results, which we then return at the end of the method. Now that the service is taken care of, let's go bind this to the user interface. In this case, the right pane of our split view is what's known as the collection view controller, which is where this code will reside. Our NS table view control is hooked up to an outlet on the collection view controller class called table. An important thing to note is that our table view is configured to use the cell based content mode. Table views on the Mac have two different content modes, cell-based and view-based, and both have very different strengths and weaknesses. If you're familiar with iOS development, view-based table views are similar to how they work on iOS. Cell-based table views provide a simple way to display tabular data and provide rich editing functionality with little effort at the cost of customizing the appearance of your table view. Both of these have different strengths, weaknesses, and performance characteristics, so each application should evaluate which of these is best suited to their use case and use the appropriate one. Note that the APIs you need to use when using a view-based table view are often different from the ones that you need to use in cell-based table views. So if you're using this video as a reference, please be careful if you're using the view-based mode. I've also defined the columns that I want in this initial version's user interface directly in Interface Builder. Importantly, I've set a unique identifier on each column which will come in handy later in our code, as we'll need to check it to provide the correct data for each row, as well as send it as the sort mode to the service. Table views on Apple platforms are powered by the data source and delegate protocols. Protocol is the word used on Apple platforms to refer to what other programming languages call interfaces, a list of things you can implement on one of your objects to provide functionality or data to other systems or components. As the name implies, implementing the data source protocol lets you provide the data for the rows and columns that populate a table view. Implementing the delegate protocol, on the other hand, lets you add supplementary behaviors to your table view, such as responding to selection changes, sorting, allowing inline editing, and drag and drop operations. Similarly to actions and outlets, you can bind the table view's data source and delegate directly through Interface Builder. In our case, the table view's data source and delegate will be the collection view controller class. Once that's bound, we can get that class prepared to fetch data and provide it through the collection view. First, we're going to want an instance variable on our collection view controller that will hold our track data for the currently shown collection, which in this case is limited to our library. This is why we've declared an instance variable called data, which is an array of track objects. By default, it will be initialized to an empty array. While we're up here, I might as well mention that there are sort mode and keyword filter instance variables also declared, which will eventually hold the identifier of the currently sorted column, as well as the current contents of the keyword filter text box. Next, we're going to need to implement a method we can call to refresh that data instance variables contents with the results of our library collection query. I've implemented it here as this reload library collection method. This is a pretty simple method. It first checks via guard let statements that its dependencies, which are the table and the service, are initialized. Then it updates the data instance variable with the results of the library collection query, which we call with the keyword filter and sort mode that we're going to hook up in a little bit. And finally, it tells the table to reload its data. Now, we actually need to implement the bare minimum of the data source and delegate so that asking the table to reload its data will actually do anything. Surprisingly, we only need to implement two methods in the data source and one for the delegate. First, we need to implement number of rows in table view, which returns an integer telling the table view how many rows it needs to display. In our case, we want this to be equal to the number of objects in our array of tracks, so we'll return data.count. Next, we need to implement table view object value for table column row. This asks us to return a text value for a given column and row. This is also pretty simple. We can go fetch the track from our array using the row number that's passed to us. Then we can compare the table column identifier that's being asked for to the ones that our app already knows about and return the corresponding metadata field. If we get an unknown column identifier, we can return this unknown identifier string just to facilitate debugging. 
And then the last method we need to implement is table view should edit table column row. This determines whether or not a given column in a table row should be editable with inline editing. This version of Caesura will not support metadata editing, so we want to disable inline editing of this table view entirely. Therefore, we will force it to always return false. We still need to handle two notification types for this to work as intended. Because reload library collection will be called in response to a notification through the use of a selector, we need to expose this function to the Objective-C runtime using the at obj-c keyword. Due to how storyboards work, our main window will be initialized and displayed technically before the app has finished initializing. So things like our library service might not be spun up yet. Because of this, we want to register to the nsapplication.didfinishlaunching notification and have it call reload library collection in response to that so that the library contents appear in our view on app launch. The other thing we need to wire up is the notification we send from the feature we implemented just before this one when we add a new track to the library. For this, we'll want to register to the appdelegate.reloadlibrary notification and once again call reload library collection in response. Now that these notifications are hooked up, Caesura is now able to list tracks in the library, but sort modes and keyword searches are still going to be ignored for the moment as they haven't been bound to the user interface. So let's go implement sort modes. All of the logic for sorting already exists in the service, so we just need to hook it up to the table headers. This will be pretty simple. By implementing the table view did click table column delegate method on our collection view controller, we can set the value of our sort mode instance variable to the identifier of the click table column. Then we can simply call reload library collection, which passes that identifier when asking the database for the results of the library collection query, and things are magically sorted accordingly on the database end. I should note that this functionality is somewhat incomplete. Mac tables have built-in supports for emphasizing the sorted column as well as whether or not that column is being sorted in ascending or descending order. I still haven't completely figured out how to hook that up, so while sorting is functional but only in ascending order, it is not reflected to the user in the table column header UI. We will do this in a future episode. If I go back to the storyboard file, you may remember that the search field is in the toolbar of the window, and that means it technically lives in a different scene from the collection view controller, which is what lists the tracks in the library. I can tie an action to the search field for when the contents change, but it needs to exist in the window controller. So that's what I did. There's an IB action declared in Caesura window controller called search terms changed, and it's hooked up to the NS search field in our toolbar. But the window controller has no direct way of talking to the collection view controller it contains, so I'm using inelegant glue here by going through notification center. As I mentioned during the last episode, this is totally a misuse of this API, but it does easily let me move where I decide to handle this event to a scope where it's more convenient for me to handle it. So here I'm sending out the appdelegate.searchTermsChange notification and attaching to it the string value that corresponds to the contents of the search field. And I'm going to flip back over to the collection view controller and show you where I'd register that notification and what I do with it. Here in the view did appear method of the collection view controller, I register to the appdelegate.searchTermsChange notification and call a method called searchTermsChange. Much like what our delegate action does when the user clicked the column header, all this does is set the keyword filter instance variable to the contents of the search field we passed along inside the notification and ask the library to reload itself. Since our service already takes into consideration the keyword filter parameter, this just all works. Again, this is a super inelegant way to handle it, and it would totally fall on its face if we allowed users to have multiple Caesar windows open at once, as all of them would receive this notification simultaneously, even though it only technically applies to a single window. It's definitely subject to change in a future version, and if you have any good ideas on how to fix these kinds of architecture issues, feel free to leave a comment. Let's move on to the last feature. Deleting tracks from the library is pretty simple. It comes down to these three things. We want a menu item that lets us delete a track from the library. That menu item should only be enabled when a track is selected. And the action of that menu item should look up the track ID of the selected track and use it to call the remove from library command. So let's start out with that remove from library command. It takes one parameter, an integer that corresponds to the selected track ID. Our service sends out two updates to the database. First, since the track is going to be gone from the library completely, it would be best if we also removed it from any existing playlists by removing all rows referring to it in the ordered playlist track table. This isn't going to be relevant until next episode when we can actually add songs to playlists, but there's no harm in adding it now. And then, of course, we delete the track from the track table. That's it. Pretty simple. Let's go hook that up to the user interface. 
We only want the menu item to be enabled when a track is selected in our table view. Let's start by implementing a method that will manage the enabled status of that menu item in the app delegate, and then we'll hook it up to the table view. In our app delegate is the method enable selection menu items. It has two arguments, selected, which tells you if a track is currently selected or not, and is library, which tells you if the user selection has occurred in the library, if true, or in a playlist, if false. This will be useful later when we have other menu items related to playlist specific operations. Like our table columns, menus and menu items can have their own identifiers as well. So here we're looking up the library menu and then the remove from library menu item via their identifiers and returning immediately if we fail to find them. If the context in which the selection changed is the library, we set the enabled status of remove from library to be equal to whether or not a row is currently selected or the value of the selected argument of this method. Now, I, I should probably stress that this method's implementation could be a lot simpler and has been improved in a future version, where instead of looking up these menu items by identifier, we simply create outlets for all of the menu items that need to be enabled or disabled dynamically and access them directly through those outlets. It is much simpler. Now we need to actually call this enable selection menu items method whenever the selection changes in our table view. So back to the collection view controller we go. We can implement the table view selection did change delegate function in our controller that will get called whenever a row is selected or unselected. And in there, after checking that our prerequisites exist with some guard let statements, we can call our enable selection menu item method on the app delegate. Our selected argument will be equal to whether the selected row on our table is not equal to minus one. Minus one is the value given to selected row on table views when nothing is selected. Our is library argument here is hard coded to true because we currently don't have to worry about any other context but the library. Now that the menu items enabled status is handled, we need to make the menu item do something. Like with our import to library menu item from earlier, we do this by declaring an IB action on the app delegate. Here once again we resort to misusing notification center. I don't know how to get a reference to the selected row in our collection view controller from the app delegate, so in this case it's easier to send a notification that says, hey, someone activated the menu item for removing the selected track from the library to the application in general, and have that part of the application with access to the selected row respond to it on its own turf. So in this case, this action merely sends out an app delegate.remove from library menu item chosen notification into the void, hoping that someone picks up on it. So if we go back to view did appear on our collection view controller class, you can see that I've registered for that app delegate.remove from library menu item chosen notification. And if we receive one, we call the remove from library menu item chosen method, which then does the right thing. As usual, we check for prerequisites via guard let statements. Then we fetch the selected row from the table, look up what track that corresponds to, and get its track ID. From that track ID, we can call our services remove from library command, and then we ask the table to refresh itself with the new contents from the database. Let's end things with a short demo of the features implemented throughout this episode. And with that, we've concluded the first batch of core features to the first release of Caesura. We've got a basic flow to add and remove tracks from a library, and we can list them within the app's UI with a few bonus features on top. Next episode is going to focus on extending this functionality to cover playlists as well. See you then.